doesn't matter whether you are a corporate that is competing with another corporate, everybody reaches a new level of efficiency when participating. The idea is actually that people start collaborating on the blockchain. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope after this uh, video, you're all awake and uh, excited to join us for the blockchain in use supply chain track hosted by Birchain and uh, Berlin Partner today. So welcome, everybody. It's great to see uh, so many faces here. And uh, we're looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you on uh, what is going on in the supply chain world with regards to blockchain and uh, what the impact also of uh, the COVID-19 crisis has been so far, and we have a great round of uh, experts here with us um, today. For those who don't know Birchain, um, we are a Berlin-based nonprofit uh, organization that is promoting and connecting the Berlin blockchain uh, ecosystem. So we have a, a packed agenda today yeah, and a lot of content that uh, is waiting for us. So my name is Ricardo and I'm the vice president of uh, Birchain, and uh, I'll be introducing the agenda to you. So we will start with uh, an introductory presentation on the state of the industry for blockchain for supply chain by uh, Anthony Day, who will also be our uh, moderator. And this will be then followed by three individual use case presentations. I will not go into detail here to not uh, take away the, the interesting parts. And um, each of these presentations will outline one particular perspective on blockchain for supply chain. And uh, the very same presenters will then also be sitting in a panel discussion at uh, the end of the session where we will go deeper into the topic of uh, blockchain for supply chains. If you have uh, any questions to the panelists, don't hesitate to please use the Q&A function and post them there. Our uh, moderator will then be picking those up uh, in the panel discussion or our presenters can also respond to them on the go if, uh, if they feel like um, doing that. So please, please uh, post the questions. This will trigger an, a very interesting exchange and discussion with our speakers. So um, without uh, further ado, I would like to hand over the word to um, Anthony Day from IBM, who is our host. Uh, Anthony is a partner in uh, IBM's uh, UK and Ireland blockchain team. He leads uh, blockchain transformations and creation of new business networks for IBM clients across uh, a range of industry sectors. He's an experienced leader with a demonstrated history of helping clients achieve growth, define impactful digital strategies and launch new businesses powered by exponential technologies such as blockchain, AI, robotics and uh, open platforms. Uh, Anthony has been running um, also his own podcast which uh, some of you might have listened to where uh, he shares regular insights and knowledge on the blockchain world. So without uh, further ado, I'll hand over the word to you, Anthony, and I'm going to stop sharing. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you to Birchain and thank you to everyone who's joined in today. Great to have you here and really excited to be joined by Rodolfo, Douglas and Nathan, uh, who are going to provide some very interesting and hopefully contrasting perspectives on the state of blockchain in supply chain as of right now. Um, Ricardo, thank you very much for the intro. I'm going to put some slides up now, just make sure that they work. Somebody let me know whether you can see this on screen. Yep. Yes, all visible. All right, let's do this. So hopefully over the course of the next hour and a half or so, we're gonna try and address some of the following things. Where is blockchain technology today? Where is it being used? What's happening? What are some of the examples or real world use cases of how blockchain is being applied? And some of my fellow panelists today have got a bunch of uh, really interesting stories around um, what's happening for real and bringing that to life. Secondly, I want to talk about what's changed, um, not just in the last six, six or so months in and around COVID-19, uh, but also over the last one to two years. What have we observed in the way that blockchain is being talked about, is being considered and being used um, that's different to a year ago or six months ago? 
we always know that the pace of change in exponential technologies is relatively fast, but particularly with blockchain and particularly with what's going on around us right now, and I'm going to allude to some of that in the next couple of slides, I think it's going to be interesting to see from the experience spoke on the panel today, what's, what's, what's changed, what's different. And then finally, what's missing? As with any adoption curve or with any exponential technology, there's always room to grow. Uh, and whether we're at the early stage on that very thin upward curve or whether we're just starting to round the corner, there's always something more that can help us to drive adoption or drive understanding or provide better commercial return when we're using the technology. So I'm really interested to hear uh, my colleagues and, and fellow panelists perspectives on what more is needed to scale. So first things first, this guy. I'm sure most of you on the call will be familiar with this image. Um, some of you may have had the misfortune to have come across this particular uh, individual over the last few months, but it is indisputable that COVID-19 has had a dramatic impact on all of us in one way or another, whether that's us individually, us as families, as citizens, uh, as business owners, as operators, and particularly in and around supply chains. Uh, scenes like um, the early stage issues, the huge multifaceted bullwhip effects leading to fights over toilet roll. It's relatively humorous when you watch it on a YouTube video, uh, but in terms of road testing and stress testing, the resilience of supply chains worldwide, uh, it has identified a number of specific challenges that depending on what industry you're in, uh, will, have, will have been very, very, very obvious. So I think as supply chain experts or as supply chain SMEs, one thing that we've all felt is six months on, we either had a robust supply chain or we didn't. And now it's about what do we do next? We're seeing not just in terms of our consumer facing trends, we're also seeing our organizational and operational trends in terms of response to COVID-19 being particularly challenged. A, num a number of us are remote working at this point in time. Uh, a number of different organizations have been challenged to get their staff back to work or into some of the traditional facilities or locations where they would have tra traditionally operated. That's having an impact on manufacturing, on logistics and distribution, thinking about the health and well-being of employees and staff, the health and well-being of third parties and contractors, the ability to manage a secure, clean uh, and hygienic site, the implications of extra use of PPE, of cleaning cleaning materials and products, et cetera, et cetera. Each one of these things in isolation has had a specific uh, and profound impact on the way we run our businesses. There is no normal at this point in time, but there are a number of observations in how we could have done things differently or how we now know we need to do things better. We all know the meme, um, but in the top left-hand corner, in reality, COVID-19 has driven some of the most profound digital transformations in the last six or 12 months. And honestly speaking, that's not a bad thing. As I said, having your business model stress tested by restrictions on supply, challenges in workforce, movements in demand, um, black swan events that go beyond business as usual, actually force executives and leaders to take stock, to reevaluate. Businesses that were on fine margins needed to transform. Organizations that can't serve their customers in the way that they typically would be able to need to pivot. And those who haven't embraced digitization and transformation in that way are most likely not going to be here in six to 12 months as organizations if they can't figure out a strategy for being able to pivot. And we've seen a number of different organizations do that in a number of different ways. In the early days, we saw car manufacturers pivoting their production away from expensive sports cars, which were clearly in lower demand, more towards medical equipment and ventilators. And you've, you've seen a number of those different stories, but that's critically important in being able to say, right, we have certain digital capabilities, certain physical capabilities. How can we continue to exist in a business? And what does it mean for our supply chain? Instead of using carbon fiber for wings and doors, we're using plastics and different 3D printing materials to be able to create ventilators. And how do we pivot the commercial model around that? And, and IBM, uh, shameless plug, but an example of some of the work that we've been doing is with Rapid Supplier Connect, which when in the healthcare systems, particularly public and private sector, we're seeing that those new medical suppliers, whether they be uh, an automotive company or any of the others, are not onboarded and not ready to be um, procured and have their services procured through the traditional financial systems in, in healthcare. Um, whether that be in the US, the UK, Russia, or further afield. And so actually being able to rapidly accelerate onboarding of buyers, suppliers, products into the healthcare system to support um, crisis management and, and supply from non-traditional sources is a non-trivial issue. 
it's one of those mundane, useful blockchain applications, but it's critically needed when you're dealing with healthcare supply chains. We've also seen particular issues around supply and demand. The example here, AirAsia, they launched a couple of months ago their open platform for trading on freight. Um, it, what boils down to really is that there is an insufficient mix or consolidation of supply and demand to keep enough planes in the air to be profitable uh, and to have visibility across the, um, the requirements for air freight. So AirAsia as a, as a company in isolation wouldn't be able to manage the, the visibility that they have and the demand that they have. So they looked at demand pooling and creating a virtual clearinghouse for supply and demand of freight, which for the airline business is critical right now. And while I can't talk about it um, for privacy purposes and for confidentiality, the concept of a virtual clearinghouse of bringing supply and demand together is something that we and, IB, we and IBM's clients are looking at in a number of different sectors and is another very, very good use for blockchain where you've got potentially commercially sensitive information, where you've got pricing, where you've got bills, bills of lading uh, and the requirement for settlement reconciliation. You can see an entire industry supply and demand patterns on a platform. But if you use blockchain in a private and permissioned way, you can do that in a way that doesn't contravene any regulations and that doesn't provide uh, any parties with necessary information that they shouldn't be privy to. And then the IBM Digital Health Pass, a prop proposition that I've been leading out, at least in Europe, Middle East and Africa for the last five, six months, working with governments, working with private sector organizations, helping with the return to work the return to travel and the return to entertainment. The concept of needing to provide health credentials to be able to access any of these different environments prior to COVID-19 really wasn't something that was on our radar, but the requirements of privacy preserving self-sovereign identity, the ability to pass sensitive information, the ability to prevent fraud, the ability to provide a digital experience across multiple parties, uh, accreditors and verifiers, public and private sector, again, is one of those use cases that's criti critically important at this time and where blockchain as a technology is well suited. It's not well suited everywhere, but this is one of those ones where right now and in this moment uh, is a capability that we're taking out and that it is transforming the way we think about the return to work, travel and entertainment. And let's not forget, everything I've talked about is the six inches in front of our face, right? What's coming next and the transformations required to get beyond COVID are not insignificant. Right? We still have to be able to return to work. We still have to be able to keep maintain the safety of ourselves, our families, our friends and colleagues. Um, but the economic impact following is going to put even further pressure on those organizations um, that are operating today in, in a mindset where they can fix what they see around the box that is their organization. And one thing that I think we've seen accelerated over the past six months is the openness and willingness to collaborate. And as we all know, blockchain and its fundamental framework is about collaboration, about working together, about combining, combining multiple parties uh, to be able to transform or do things differently. And I can see that over the next six months or 12 months, the opportunities and the necessity to collaborate as even further pressure is put on economies and businesses and supply chains is going to be critically important. And let's not forget about sustainability. Six to 12 months ago, uh, we were all standing on stages talking about how we could look at um, the impact of carbon emissions, how we could look at the sustainability, not just from a, a supply chain perspective in terms of carbon, but in terms of sustainability from a people perspective, the people planet profit mantra. And granted that's sort of gone away a little bit and we've received some small term benefits with fewer planes in the air and fewer cars on the road. But let's be clear, the acceleration, uh, exponential acceleration of some of the climate impact factors that we've seen that I've talked about on other shows hasn't gone away. And particularly for supply chain organizations, that's a consideration that's not going to go away uh, even after COVID-19 and our impending recession. So not that I want to present a bad news story at the start of the show. Uh, I didn't want to set this off on a negative term. But what is critically important is that we remember that blockchain has taught us that collaboration models can work, that companies, competitors, peers can work together to transform industries, to transform processes. It doesn't always have to be sexy. It doesn't have to be the self-sovereign identity platform of the future. It can be procurement. It can be supply chain visibility. It can be stock keeping levels. It can be bills of lading. It can be lots of things that are not going to set the world on fire from, uh, you're not gonna be making Hollywood movies about this stuff. But in terms of very, very large organizations moving a significant amount of things, widgets, digits across the world, um, across multiple markets with multiple competitors, many to many relationships, 
that's going to add significant value if we reconstruct how we do it. And so that's my short summary of what we've learned over the past six months from my perspective. A few examples in there, um, but we're gonna get a bunch more. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Douglas. He's the CEO of Circular. Uh, and Douglas, I'm gonna give you the mic and I'd love to hear more about the work that you guys are doing in traceability of, of minerals. Thank you. Um, just waiting to take over the sharing of the screen. All yours, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Right, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, just put that, make that large. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Great. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. And um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity here to, uh, to, to, to tell you a little bit more about what we've been up to in mineral supply chains. And actually it fits quite nicely with the theme that Anthony was talking around you know, climate change and the energy transition. The reason, of course, we're moving to, to things like electric vehicles is because of climate change. Um, yet uh, the, the, the beautiful irony, of course, is that, um, you know, in sourcing minerals like cobalt and creating batteries, lithium-ion batteries for cars, um, we are embedding a massive amount of carbon from the supply chain's contribution in the manufacture of the things that are supposed to make a difference. So uh, I'll unpack that a little bit as we go. But first of all, who on earth is circular? Um, let's, if I can get my slides to work. That's weird. Seems to be frozen. Let me try this way. Right, good. Um, we're a software company. We're about three and a half years old. Um, and uh, we, we first did field trials using our uh, solution, which includes blockchain and a number of other technologies in uh, Rwanda tracking tantalum, which is a conflict mineral from mines all the way through to manufacturers. Um, and, and now our business, a few years on, and I'll tell you a little bit more about who we work with in a second, um, is, is both tracking raw materials through supply chains to demonstrate responsible sourcing, uh, as well as to um, support the net zero ambitions of, of you know, equipment manufacturers, like, for example, car manufacturers. So uh, just a snapshot of some of the sorts of people we work with. All of these are public domain, um, but there are others as well that I that I can't yet talk about. You'll see a number of car manufacturers here like Volvo and Daimler, um, and I'll use those as examples as I speak. Um, some of the world's largest uh, electric vehicle battery manufacturers, LG Chem and CATL are, are customers uh, and, and on our platform. YU Cobalt happens to be the largest uh, cobalt refiner in the world. Um, uh, Boeing, Total um, and Volvo are also investors of ours. And um, today, there are two reasons why car manufacturers work with us. The first is obviously to demonstrate responsible sourcing in supply chains. And that means a, a reliable chain of custody of a commodity from its source at a mine site, perhaps an artisanal mine site in the Congo, all the way through the, the supply chain to the point of consumption where uh, a, a battery module is put into a car. But of course, that's not the end of the story, because of course, that battery module at the end of its useful life in a car has a potential second life, which is a more efficient use for that battery at the end of its life um, in a car than merely recycling it, which invests a whole pile more additional carbon into that battery. Um, the second reason is around uh, supporting the net zero ambitions of car manufacturers. When you have a reliable flow of materials, and I'm going to explain how we do this in a second. When you have a reliable flow of materials through a supply chain, you can attach other information to that flow of materials, such as, for example, the mixture of energy, renewable energy, non-renewable energy, carbon offsets, attributable to segments of that supply chain, whether it's facilities or transport segments. And so what you're essentially doing is building from the ground up a scope three assessment. Um, why does it matter? Um, an electric vehicle um, has a, a far lower carbon footprint in life, but a far higher carbon footprint at the point at which you or I might pick up the keys. And 70% of that is the contribution of the supply chain. So, um, uh, you know, understanding the flow of materials and which participants in the supply chain are adding which amount of carbon actually is a tool to enable smarter procurement, to start to select the routes through the supply chain that car manufacturers can use in order to um, reduce the embedded carbon. So let's talk a little bit about how the technology is brought together with a number of other technologies in order to, to achieve this. So imagine for a second now that you are standing in a muddy puddle in a mine site um, somewhere in the Congo. Um, 
and a, a bag, uh, a 30 kilo or 50 kilo sack of ore is brought to a collection point. Um, and that could have been dug by artisanal miners, i.e. people digging with shovels. Our, most of our view of mining presumably is of you know, large scale mining operations. And clearly there's a lot of that too, but it's the artisanal mining that is of particular concern, especially when it may involve child labor or other human rights abuses. Uh, and this is endemic, it's not just cobalt supply chain, this is endemic of supply chains um, across the world, whether it is you know, forced labor in the cotton supply chain or deforestation um, as a result of, of, of palm oil growth. But anyway, we're standing in a mine site and, a, and a, a, a bag of material is brought to a collection point. And the very first thing you have to do is create a reliable digital twin for that commodity at its source. Unlike a lettuce or a diamond, that has a unique, sorry, the lettuce doesn't, but but you know they, they are the same at their source as they are at the point of consumption, albeit that the diamond has been cut and polished. It's much harder to track something that changes multiple times during its journey. So you know the ore will go to smelting from there to refining, amalgamation with other materials, um, and then um, into eventually components which become subassemblies, which become a car. Um, and so it all starts with creating a reliable digital twin. And, and we use, um, uh, we use facial recognition to understand the actors involved, including who is first recording the information. The location will come from the mobile device that is that is used for this um, activity of recording, but it's not quite that simple because you have to contend with concerns around GPS spoofing. We have um, dating apps and Pokemon Go to thank for a world in which it's very easy, particularly on an Android device, to download an app that will allow you to claim that you are somewhere else other than your true location. So defense against GPS spoofing, including being confident you're inside the geofence of the mine site rather than outside it, because of course GPS signals are randomized. Um, then the composition of the material, of course, comes from a handheld mass spectrometer, which you know, routinely used at, at mine sites because you want to pay your miners for good dirt, not any old dirt. And then finally, the attachment of a tag. Um, and although our platform is tag agnostic, it, it, use, it generates by default QR codes um, or QR code tags that have attributes, which means they can only be used at this mine site this week, uh, potentially by this person. And it means that there's no black market for those tags, which is a, 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 a significant problem with existing bag and tag schemes, which have been around for sort of 10, 15 years in the copper belt in Central Africa. So that combination of information of you know who you are, where you are, what the material is, and its identity given to this blob of material, this parcel of material, is the basis of that digital twin. The challenge then is the digital thread. And you, you heard me mention earlier that the material changes. So at every one of those transformation steps, what we've done is, is, is coded what we, you know, what we call code the chemistry. Essentially, um, and I'm going to use the analogy of making a cake. We all know that you know, so much flour plus some eggs plus some sugar goes through a defined mixing process um, into an oven for a defined period of time in order to create a cake. Well, that's not dissimilar from a chemical transformation process that may happen at a smelter or a refiner. So you know how much material goes in, you know what process steps have to be followed between goods in and goods out, you know what the elapsed time should be, and, and if any of those rules is, are broken, this cake was not made with this flour. Um, and that basic principle can be applied um, at multiple steps through the supply chain. The grayed out segments on this diagram represent track and trace. Um, clearly, you know, you need to be able to follow the material, but the material isn't fundamentally changing on its journey across the Pacific. There might be some oxidization, but it's not a fundamental transformation. When you get a little bit further into the supply chain, you have component manufacturers, for example, such as a battery cell manufacturer who, who has a defined process between goods in and goods out. And we take scan points along the way directly from their uh, production management systems in order to connect the, the, the specific material at goods in to the specific product at goods out. Um, and essentially that's how traceability is being applied. So where's the blockchain fit into this? Well, you know, supply chains, particularly those with enormous asymmetry between the upstream and the downstream in terms of size of access, sophistication of technology, et cetera, et cetera, um, are, are um, a near classic use case uh, for a distributed ledger as a way of creating trust in a network of actors who do not necessarily know each other uh, and, and in sort of circumstances where um, fraud or misrepresentation is the core problem that one is trying to solve. So the blockchain gives the benefit of immutability to the data. Why is that important? Well, the amount of time it takes for 
um, the material to make its way from a mine site to a car is measured in months. It can take four or five months for the material to, to go all the way through that journey until it finds its way into a car. You don't want anybody to have the ability to rewrite history if it would suit them to do so. So you're capturing data in real time, which is encrypted um, and, and is then selectively unlocked depending on where it eventually ends up because none of these supply chains are linear um, and you don't, you know, the miner doesn't know where their material is going because it could go to any number of potential cars or, you know, consumer electronics or any other potential user of battery raw materials. So the blockchain gives the benefit of immutability and the uh, ability to create that federated trust, which I'm sure is a sort of term that we're going to talk about a little bit more this afternoon as well. Um, and I mentioned other technologies. We, we use obviously databases um, for data that we don't want to store on chain, obviously personal data about who the actors involved might be at the upstream is not something that you would want to put into an immutable ledger. It wouldn't be consistent with the right to be forgotten under sort of privacy legislation, which exists in a whole variety of jurisdictions. Um, I'm obviously, you know, we're all in the EU, so we'll be aware of GDPR. Um, and, and there are some things it doesn't make sense to to gum up the 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 distributed ledger with. So supporting documentation, all the rest of it does not necessarily have to be written to a blockchain. It can be hashed to a blockchain as a sort of a, a blob of data. So it still has the benefit of, of, of um, immutability. So what I'm describing to you is, is the basic method that is now being used by car manufacturers like the ones that I mentioned and, and others in supply chains in order to help them understand that they're responsibly sourcing. When you have that flow of materials, you can then add other information about each of these steps, such as, for example, energy use as a way of trying to create an end-to-end -end picture of the amount of embedded carbon in the supply chain. I mentioned briefly, I'm gonna shut up in a second, hand over to, to the next speaker, but I mentioned um, uh, briefly the circular economy. After about seven years in a car, an electric vehicle battery has, has finished its useful life in a vehicle, but that doesn't mean to say the battery itself is useless. Now, clearly it could be recycled, um, but that would mean the, uh, the further investment of, of more energy in that process of recycling, um, when in reality, there could be a second life for that battery in an energy storage system, for example. Um, and the systems today uh, to, connect an end of life battery with a potential second life use case nearby, because obviously that's the most efficient way of doing it, do not exist. But you know, some of us are starting to work on this question of how do you um, reliably connect an end of life resource with its potential second life so that recycling is not necessarily the first option. Um, same principles would apply to the circular economy about you know, what is its state of health, where is it, who owns it, um, and, and how do you then connect it to that second life use. Um, again, that would be done on the blockchain, but it doesn't exist yet. So um, with that, I'm just going to, uh, to, to, to draw to a close by saying thank you very much indeed for, for listening. Um, my coordinates are here on this slide. Um, happy to answer questions today and also happy to answer questions offline as well. Um, and with that, back to you guys, thank you. Very good. Doug, thank you very much for that. Sounds like you've covered an awful lot of ground in a uh, very short period of time and some incredible names that you're working with too. Digital twins and blockchain come up fairly regularly as one of those um, topics that is obviously critically important. Um, have you got any kind of observations or kind of key learnings from working with digital twins in this particular process that others in a, you know, similar supply chain sectors or, or across others, um, what, what would be your kind of two or three key tips for working with digital twins? Yeah. The, the single hardest challenge is how do you give a digital identity to something that doesn't have a unique form that you can't measure scientifically or precisely? And it doesn't make economic sense to attach some incredibly clever IoT device to you know, a, 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 a low value bag of ore at a mine site. Uh, and so that's the core challenge. In, and we could be talking about you know, palm nuts that become palm oil, or we could be talking about bales of cotton where the economics at the upstream don't allow for the use of, I, of course you could attach an RFID GPS enabled IoT, blah, blah, something, but it's just not economically viable. And so how you give a reliable identity to something and that that something doesn't then change 
as it changes hands two or three times before it gets to the smelter where it's first formally scanned and turned into something else, for example, is a core challenge. And we took quite a lot of time working with miners um, and sort of negotiations and traders in the tantalum supply chain in Rwanda to try and address some of these questions. The other thing, of course, is you're dealing with people with, you know, varying degrees of literacy and education and motivation um, at the very upstream. Fundamentally, many of them are, are you know, mining or doing whatever they are as, as a form of assistance. And that's just the non-blockchain engineers, right? Yeah, yeah, precisely. But but then think about the miners. You know, the fact is that you know the last thing you want to do is is add friction into what is already you know a relatively high friction environment. Um, and so trying to find a way to to marry very simple technology. You know, we have a, a role based mobile app that that is as simple as press the start button and follow the two instructions before you submit. And and depending on your role, you get the ability to do different things. Um, trying trying to find a way to, to bring legitimacy with the simplest possible technology, even if what's behind it is clever plumbing, is is a core challenge. Brilliant. Thank you for that. I'm sure that, that conversation could continue long into the night. And we're, we're, I can see Rodolfo is chomping at the bit here. So um, thank, thank you. you, Doug. We'll probably come back to some of that um, in, in just a minute. But I think the, the importance of UX in blockchain is so often under considered. Um, but it's clear you've got some good learnings there. So thank you for sharing. All right. It's over to Rodolfo Quijano. He's the head of blockchain at Henkel has been a guest of mine on the Blockchain Won't Save the World podcast. So I'm hoping you save some good stuff for this audience too, Rodolfo. Have at it. The, the, sh the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Anthony. And yes, I'm hoping that the uh, audience will find my uh, talk interesting. So let me get started by sharing my screen, making sure that works. All right. All right, so I'm... Guessing everybody can see my screen and getting ahead of myself here a, a bit in the presentation, uh, but just but as then as I don't see any messages complaining that I can that you can't see my screen, then I'll start right away. So oh, good, uh, good to go. All right. So uh, as Anthony's uh, introduced myself, I'm Rodolfo Quijano. I'm head of blockchain at, at Henkel, and I'm going to talk to you today about how we are using blockchain to build transparent supply chains. So, in in my perspective, I decided to pick uh, not one use case uh, to go into more of the three use cases that we're currently working on at, at Henkel, uh, but I also thought maybe like like Doug. Uh, introduce myself and also the, the company we're working for. In case you don't know Henkel, I mean, Henkel is a German company. So if many of you are already uh, joining us from Germany, you might know us from, from personal detergent uh, because it is also a more than 100 year old company. However, not everybody in the world knows what Henkel is. So here are some uh, lovely facts and figures from coming from my corporate communications department who was kind enough to provide them for me. Uh, if I would to define Henkel in a nutshell, I would say that more or less half of our, our revenue comes from our industrial business where we do adhesive technologies and are a leader in that worldwide. And more or less the other half of our revenue comes from the FMCG, so the fast moving consumer goods categories that we have. Uh, so as you can see there on the screen, we have uh, brands and products in the area of beauty care and laundry and home care, like the personal detergent that I mentioned. And we have a presence all around the world. Uh, as you can tell, I'm also not a German, so I started my career with Henkel Mexico, and I find myself over here in Europe. Uh, and proud to say that uh, in, in kind of that capacity is to help uh, Henkel pioneer the use of blockchain uh, to bring transparency to our supply chain. So I'll actually start off... Uh, on the perspective of, of how we do that for a transparent global trade, uh, speaking specifically of how that is handled in regards to the tax and trade processes. So generally what we try to do, at least from, from our perspective, is to look at the problems that we're experiencing within the supply chain and see you know, which ones are those are actually uh, cases where you could have a, a kind of a benefit from using blockchain. In this case, we started with our foreign trade department to look at tax and trade and how uh, the fact that you move uh, goods from one country to the next and you have these complex supply chains uh, spanning continents and many countries around the world, uh, you uh, kind of run into the fact that you have to have these complex exchanges between stakeholders. I think, Anthony, you were alluding in your introduction a little bit into the uh, how, let's say, how 
uh, the resilience was tested in this perspective because many of the supply chains were built to be actually quite flexible. So you, they were built uh, to work in, let's say, uh, good times. So when you could trade, let's say, a, a shipping uh, lane from, from A to B or from, let's say, a supplier from, uh, from country A to B within a certain amount of certainty that you can get your supply there. Uh, but that also impacts so in a certain way how you handle the whole topic around customs and the tax you paid for, for bringing in uh, products from different, uh, let's say, uh, countries. Uh, so as you can imagine, these are also very non-digitalized uh, processes. And together with, uh, with Siemens, we decided to found a industry-wide platform that we're calling Tax Chain. We we're trying to bring solve these transparency issues in tax and trade, and also to help digitalize the processes that we have there. So. Uh, as you can read there in my last bullet point, but I'll try to go into a little bit more detail to give you a bit more meat than what you will get out of the uh, presentation or the recording. Uh, so yes, we're looking at specific um, flow of, of the supply chain where we have, let's say, um, the necessity to understand where is this um, raw material coming from? Is it coming from a country which has a preferred or origin? Is the then the upstream linked also in a certain way, uh, proving that we can to claim a different, let's say, tax status on the topic. Uh, so that's kind of the, let's say, the core where we're building this topic around. However, we understand that it's also good for us to uh, provide uh, transparency into how we're complying with the duties uh, when you're clearing something like customs or when you're playing something like your value added tax, especially in the European Union. Are you making sure that is also and transparently reported, no matter how much you're you're paying your supplier, and then your customers paying yourself, and then the consumers in the end also paying that uh, that perspective. Uh, so from from that perspective, kind of, of course, the benefits are making sure that we have a, a more digitalized and automated process there, which is transparent. Uh, in, in the way that we were able to understand, okay, how many of the stakeholders of the supply chain have been playing for a specific, let's say. Uh, product that we're uh, manufacturing at Henkel. What are the countries and uh, areas of origin this is coming from? Uh, what are the tax preferential status we can have? And how can we save, you know, a couple bucks here, here or there for, for Henkel? Uh, notwithstanding, of course, some of those in, in making sure that we can also uh, comply with audits in a, in a cheaper, quicker way. The second use case has to do more with logistics. So a little bit more of an operational topic and a little bit, I guess, more uh, to the core and heart to many of the supply chain enthusiasts in today's call. Uh, we decided to pick the maybe for some exciting, maybe for some not so exciting topic of load carrier management, uh, because we also figured out that, you know, uh, within the, let's say the logistics uh, departments of our warehouses and our factories, we were facing issues in transparency so there's, of course, many other issues that you can ha have when you're working on a warehouse. But if you focus in on those that uh, blockchain can help with, uh, understanding how many pallets do you have, uh, where are they, which uh, which customer have they been sent to, especially when you work like you see in the picture with something like a chip pallet, where you have uh, cl these closed pools where you're actually paying a provider uh, for, for leasing those out to you becomes quite an important. Uh, so for this, uh, this problem, what we decided to do was to uh, join block for log since 2018, uh, which is basically a blockchain ecosystem led by GS1 Germany, where we're now more than 15 German companies with other big retailers as well, not just manufacturers like Henkel, uh, where we're trying to enable the transparent and digital management of load carrier. Uh, what's not on the chart, but you can also imagine is that this process was also not uh, digitalized. So the actual pallet receipt note, which has a, a, a very fancy German name that I can't seem to, to recall, um, is done on, was done on paper. And of course, that leads to things like disputes, uh, not showing, not knowing what your inventory is like, uh, charges from your closed loop partners, which maybe you don't necessarily agree to. Um, and it's done basically, of course, as, as, as Anthony was mentioning, through an app. Our warehouse uh, people are th like those you see there on the screen. They're working with forklifts. They're at the site. They don't have time to go back to their to their laptops and work that way. So we need to make sure that the users, every point of the let's say of the uh, of the use of these load carriers, can input the data. And that yes, of course, then the back office people are able to see things like reports and whatever. Uh, but the more important benefits that we're looking at is that we're able to exchange these these pallets and have a clear idea of where they're at. 
And last but not least, so very close to what Douglas was mentioning in regards to uh, what they're doing with, with uh, conflict materials and, and cobalt. Uh, of course, we're also having a look at how blockchain can support transparent sourcing. So responsible sourcing is actually something very important to handle. And this for us has to do with a lot of the raw materials we're buying in. So we are also, if you had a chance to check out some of these uh, smaller uh, squares in my introduction of Henkel chart, you will also notice that we uh, consider ourselves leaders in sustainability. And we have a lot of initiatives around that. And in order to kind of claim this, of course, we need to make sure that the raw materials we're sourcing are done in an environmental and socially responsible way. Uh, and, and here basically, so what we're trying to do to uh, ensure that we're doing this and to uh, support the people who are working in the strategies around responsible sourcing is to partner with our suppliers in blockchain ecosystems. And we're doing that basically for two, two things at, at, at the beginning is one to map our upstream supply chain. Uh, as, as Douglas in the previous uh, presentation also mentioned, you don't necessarily have a very good, very good visibility and who are all the players upstream uh, that you're working with. And as you can see there from the picture of our brand Nature Box, you have uh, uh, items such as avocados or vanilla or uh, ylang ylang or whatever other ingredients we have uh, to make our, our products smell good or to work good for or, or to provide the, let's say, the benefits we say to the hair or to the skin. Uh, but this goes back down to a farmer. Mm -hmm. And this farmer might uh, encounter a very, let's say, complex supply chain from from the moment they harvest to the moment the, to the moment these uh, what and whatever, uh, let's say, raw material came out of this this avocado uh, reaches our factory. So, understanding where are those uh, supply chain players. How many steps in the supply chain do we have? Are there any risks in our supply chain to, to things like uh, as a, in the area of, let's say, of, of people working with the lack of sustainability or lack with respect to human rights? Uh, I think problem number one to solve is understanding what's, what's out there. Uh, so, so having transparency and who's playing in our supply chain is very important. And of course, uh, once you understand what is your exposure or what are kind of the, who are the players in your supply chain, it's also important to track these key sustainability KPIs. So can you, um, uh, if we look at the topic like certifications, uh, some, if you have something like a fair trade ingredient, so when was it uh, certified as fair trade registered? Who has this written, done this registration? Have we audited that registration? So how many of our suppliers and how many of the players in our, uh, on our stake, stakeholder analysis have actually gone through this certification? And then of course, what this allows us to do is to take actions to maybe if we need to, we need to renegotiate with maybe some medium to bad players if that happens uh, in our analysis uh, and build a better, more sustainable supply chain, but it also helps us uh, reach our sustainability targets. So if we're saying we're going to reach uh, a certain, let's say, uh, percentage of certified sources, let's say, let's once again, take the example here of the avocado, uh, uh, and where we know we're at, let's say 60% or 70% right now, to reach that 100%, it's important to have that transparency in the supply chain. Yes, so, and that's honestly, that it's it basically from, from my side, I thought I would rather not go maybe into deep depth into the different use cases that we had, but more to give you a, a, a let's say, an overview of the use cases we're, we're running with currently. And that is a corporate, you know, uh, that we are actually then uh, trying to put put out there in the market and have some benefits. As you can imagine, from a corporation perspective, it's also sometimes about the business case. Uh, so you need to somehow match the whole uh, emerging technology perspective, let's say, um, difficulties maybe in adoption of, of something that's new uh, with, a, with a reasonable potential, uh, let's say, return on investment that you might have for these initiatives. Thank you, Rodolfo. And as you as you were talking through that, that's the exact point I want to double click on because, given you're the, the kind of the primary enterprise representative here in in, in the uh, in the webinar, I want just to kind of ask. You've actually got three and, and a number of other quite diverse use cases that you're focusing on, which I guess touch on different areas of the business or potentially different stakeholders. What's your kind of two or three key points in terms of um, approaching? enterprise stakeholders around using emerging technology or trying a more decentralized approach to some of the well-known problems. How do you pitch that? How do you have success in stakeholder management? 
well, that's actually a, a, a big challenge. And I think lots of people have that out there. Uh, I think like with many stakeholder analysis, Anthony, it really does start at the very beginning with understanding your stakeholder. So what are their, um, let's say, what are their targets? What's, uh, what beats into their, to their heart? Um, for example, we had a change of management uh, very recently. And where I can say, well, whereas before you were more focused on making sure, let's say, uh, that you had, let's say, a plan, a two, three, five-year plan, uh, we have a lot of questions now about the, around the return on investment. It's, so, so from from that perspective, you need you need to kind of change a little bit the story of identifying use cases in blockchain that have potential, and put it in the let's say in the words of well, what is this potential in regards to return on investment? When you tr when you kind of make that message more clear to them, then you can go the opposite way and say, okay, and this is the plan. This is what we were trying to achieve in year number one. This is what we think we will be in year number three. This is what we think will be in number five. And of course, like with any emerging technology or innovation, you try to build in the gates and decisions to say, hey, have we succeeded in proving that the technology works? Have we succeeded in proving that the others in the ecosystem are benefiting from that? And then, of course, hopefully one day on the whole market is, is benefiting from these platforms. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for that. And last question, and then I'll let Nathan have the, uh, have the mic. How ready do you feel um, some of your stakeholders are for the types of collaboration models or um, cooperation type models that I think some of those platforms are going to likely end up in? Do, do you see an, a change in mindset around collaborating with the industry or, or, or suppliers in terms of working together on technology? I would say yes. I mean, it always depends, on, I guess, in the individual. But what I've seen over the last couple of years is that it has uh, the collabor the appetite for collaboration has increased. Um, you don't see as many initiatives where it's one party pushing. It's now two, three parties. And for example, in our blog for log perspective, it's 15 partners uh, working to push that out. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, as you said, you don't have a little bit of, of, of friendly competition, right? If you hear there's a use case very similar to yours, you immediately try to you know, move ahead, move a bit quicker, or at least uh, try to somehow position yourself in that perspective. But in the end, I think it's healthy. One from an adoption perspective, and of course, uh, the more competition there is, the better the platforms will be. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, so it's not, it's not just the the startups and the systems integrators out there who feel the pressure of competition. You guys are looking left and right in terms of who else is working with blockchain too. Yes, of course. I mean, whenever you have a press release about somebody doing something similar, it, it brings a little bit of, of 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 motivation into the teams. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Rodolfo. Nathan, coming to us live from somebody's mountain somewhere, Shazam, and he appears. How's it going, Nathan? Going great. Thanks, Anthony. All right. The stage is yours. Take it uh, away. Get the share screen up here and we'll, we'll rock off to it. Um, I'm going to keep just start talking and assume that you can see my screen here. Um, oh, that's not where we, we can indeed see your screen, Nathan. Crack on. All right. But that's not what we want to be showing. Sorry. All right. So, yeah, as, as I'm getting my screen ready here, um, just everyone, just uh, Nathan Anderson with ScanTrust, and a lot of the presentations we've seen and uh, and heard already today have been focused a lot on the, the I guess we call the the upstream side of uh, the supply chain. And really, what I'm going to dive into a little bit more today is some examples of the downstream uh, supply chain. Once you have a finished good and it starts to make its way um, to to a consumer. Uh, and specifically in the context of CPG companies in the food and beverage in industry um, right now. And we're still loading up right here. And so, you know, I think the, the main um, issue that we've seen that is really challenging um, the food and beverage industry today, it, it comes down to trust. Um, and what we've seen specifically over the last 10 years, it hasn't happened overnight, it's been growing and building and certainly has been um, accelerated by COVID-19, as you mentioned earlier, Anthony, is that large global food producers and large brands in general um, have been steadily losing market share to smaller local brands. And, and a big driver behind this is that a large majority of consumers do not trust um, big brands. They do not trust trust uh, large food manufacturers. Um, uh, there's been a, a playbook at play for, for decades now about from a marketing perspective and how food has been um, delivered 
to, to consumers that due to a convergence of multiple technologies and mobility um, and connectivity being big large drivers of this and digital savviness of consumers, that consumers know they can access more information uh, about products and they're demanding this um, from, from companies. And so what we've seen is slowly that small challenger brands who are uh, more transparent about the products they they're, um, that, that they're, they're, they're manufacturing and sharing with the consumers that are more sustainable, ethical in how they go about it are really winning the hearts and minds um, of, uh, and most importantly, the wallets uh, of consumers. And what we've seen here is both with small uh, brands and big brands alike, that digitalization uh, and, and blockchain are becoming big drivers, uh, uh, big tools that they're using to drive this consumer engagement. And I want to share a little bit about what we're doing at ScanTrust um, today and how, how that's going. So at ScanTrust, what we're doing to give context to this, 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 um, this challenge we've talked about, we are a connected goods platform. Um, and essentially with a con by connecting your products, giving each product a unique digital identity, digitizing them um, and being able to track them through, through, the, through the cloud, um, what you're able to do as a brand is really to mitigate risk in your supply chain by bringing more intelligence and visibility to how products are moving through your supply chain at, from the, the manufacturing point to consumers. Uh, and then at the same time, you're creating new touch, po uh, touch points with your consumers um, at the point of sale or post-purchase um, that allows you to have a direct one-on-one -on -one personalized communication with them um, and, and really unlocks growth um, opportunities as well as uh, valuable ways to, to share your brand narrative. Um, we, we've been doing this for over six years now. Um, we work across the globe. We've deployed projects all over the world. Uh, we see this uh, type of use of packaging connect connectivity growing across multiple uh, industry verticals, not just CPG and food and beverage. Uh, we work with, with, with luxury companies, pharmaceutical companies, um, luxury watches, apparel, yoga mat companies. But really, first and foremost, we see that in the CPG um, space and food and beverage. This is growing quite, click, uh, quite, quite quickly uh, due to this consumer-led uh, demand or pull from them that is forcing customers, um, these brands, to, 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 um, to react. And, and really what we see that we're doing is it all starts with giving each product, each individual product, a secure, unique identifier. And I'll come back to that secure, unique identifier point because it's very important in the, in the context of blockchain where we're talking about having a secure digital asset uh, and, and a physical product as well. But the concept is fairly simple. You, you add a unique identifier to, to the product product, users in the supply chain, either consumers or internal supply chain users um, and partners can authenticate and interact with that uh, unique digital identity to get some sort of valuable results and contact back um, from um, the, the product itself and interact with it. And then each scan um, increase, uh, uh, as valuable, each scan is a data point. And this data provides a tremendous amount of granular intelligence on an individual product, how it's flowing through the supply chain, uh, as well as the consumers who are interacting with this and give you a real insight into direct consumer behavior, not just some sort of you know, survey that people are set, talking about, oh, how I feel or what is their opinion. Um, and, and how we enable that is developing this, this connected goods platform that we, we mentioned, which really acts as a bridge between the offline world to the online world and O, o to O. And it, it touches and first and integrates into the manufacturing process to streamline integration of unique identifiers into the product packaging. Uh, and then acts um, as a bridge to push and pull information from various systems and associate those to the unique identifiers, whether that be your own internal ERP system, a, a blockchain traceability system, such as say, like, uh, like Douglas mentioned earlier uh, on Circular, um, and then assign those attributes to, to the QR code um, or the unique identifier. So when actors in, in um, downstream in the supply chain interact with that good. It's a seamless push of information in a very much in a personalized and dynamic way, meaning that each and every product that you are scanning will, will give you different information because of course, each and every product specifically at the batch or lot level is having a, a, a journey that is unique to other products. And so a lot of projects that we see um, and, and implement where if uh, you were to find a product in the supermarket today and then another one a few days later or certainly a month later and you scan that, you're gonna get different dynamic information to drive a really personalized um, it, it, it experience. 
Um, now, one thing that we've also added and layered onto this platform is actually a secure QR code. Because what, what we've seen, um, and, and sometimes uh, this is lost within blockchain projects where we talk about, oh, well, some information's on a blockchain. Um, it's secure, it's authentic, it's verifiable. Um, and while that might be true for the digital audit trail, um, counterfeit goods, counterfeit products, and hijacking of blockchains or the information on the blockchain is all too common. Uh, in fact, uh, just la last year, roughly you know, a little less than 8% of all trade and imports coming into the EU was illicit trade and fake products. And so what we've done is we've added intrinsic security into unique QR codes. So while you do have some level of protection by having each and every product you, um, unique serialization, this is applied to the pharmaceutical industry, um, for, for instance, it is very easy to copy a unique identity. And by copying a unique identity, you can also hijack the information that's being shown um, once you scan that code and are pulling the information. And so with our secure code, we're able to determine um, just using a scan of a simple smartphone, whether the product or the code you're interacting with is an original print or a copy of that. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more why that's important. So, you know, uh, a, a process, you know, that what it ends up with the consumer, and this is a process that increasingly people are becoming familiar with, and I'm sure a lot of people on the call are here, is you have a product and we chose a beer product because I'm told I'm, I'm starting uh, my speech around happy hour. And since we're an hour in, we, we, we need to keep it a little lighter. Uh, but imagine, a, you know, experience, we have a, a beer bottle, you're, you're, you're scanning the code, you're getting back a dynamic, unique response. You, you can know if this product is, is real or fake, but then you're, you're having multiple options to now interact with this product based off its specific product attributes um, that are associated to it, or even tying that into other loyalty campaigns, other promotions that might be on, going on by the marketing team and then have that data to analyze. So moving on to how this applies in, in, into a, a blockchain, and this is true for any unique identity, but we're, we're using the, the um, the example of scan trust right here is really what we see is the marrying of the you know the, the unique identifier um, of the product with the digital twin in, in 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 a blockchain and so in in the instance of the projects we implement we start and brings intrinsic security to the physical good. So that when you are scanning and interacting with this product, you're ensuring that you are interacting with a, a, a real product. And that if, if it's a counterfeit or fake, you will not continue on the journey to the verifiable, um, um, uh, you know, a digital audit trail that is coming um, from, from a blockchain. And, um, and really how we, we, we look at it is it is very much uh, an as agnostic view of which blockchains you can work into. We don't view that just uh, there is one solution that, that fits all. Uh, unique identifiers and connected product platforms need to be extremely versatile uh, and open to the, the various types of solutions that are out there, as well as the challenges that are facing being faced in, in, in their supply chain. So, it, you know, kind of looking at this screen from, from you know, bottom to top, uh, what we're seeing at the all the way bottom is kind of that classic farm to fork um, um, su supply chain. Um, and and Scantrus, we are not involved in that whole process. What we really see in the projects that we're implementing to create true end to end um, traceability, that, that farm to fork um, transparency and traceability really requires multiple actors across both the upstream, the, the production and manufacturing points, uh, and then the downstream, where you actually have multiple systems and solutions, both internal and external, that are working together in an interoperable manner to allow for the steady flow of, of, of data as the products and the items move from different states. And I think, you know, Douglas earlier really hit on this um, very well in terms of the challenges on the upstream side, um, all of these systems to actually get to the point where you have a consumer who can scan and have trust that this is a verifiable claim, these systems need to be working together. And ultimately, um, on, on top of it, you need a, a, an events layer, a connected products platform that is able to tie together and ingest all of this information in a streamlined and scalable way, and then also push this aggregated data connected to a product into a public or, and or private blockchain. So we, we, we work with um, multiple different blockchains. As I mentioned, we're, we're, we're blockchain agnostic. There's an example of some of the few ones that we work on there from Hyperledger um, to, to SAP, who in, in, in the case of the, uh, the food and beverage industry have a very interesting material traceability option that's layered in on top of the infrastructure of many clients that are rolling out. Um, and it's quite exciting. Um, 
and, and, and really what it gets down to at, at its core and what we believe is that open standards um, and that foundation of digitalization um, uh, uh, along the different solutions are imperative. And then without having a strong interoperable um, digitalization layer and solutions that can work together, um, the blockchain that sits above it doesn't really matter. And really that's a foundation. And too often we see very often in, in projects, you know, that although people are getting uh, more sophisticated about it is people want to jump right to the blockchain. But before you even get to the blockchain, there's a whole underbelly of digitalization um, and work that needs to be done to ensure you have quality data to be an input. Um, we all know the saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Well, with blockchain, it's garbage in, garbage forever. Um, and so really that's ultimately at Scantrust, what we're focused on is helping to bring higher quality um, digital um, um, data that will then be layered and tagged to, to a blockchain. And so moving on to a, a, a blockchain in use, uh, since this is a theme of the um, of the talk today, I want to talk about a project that we were, were part of um, that was launched by, by Unilever with one of their flagship uh, brands, Knorr, uh, in Vietnam. It's been live for over a year now and, and, and has been going on tens and tens of, I believe, maybe even hundreds of millions of products um, right now. And it was responding to some of the direct challenges that many food and beverage companies see in the market today. You know, first and foremost, there was a demand from consumers, a pull saying, hey, I want to know more about the products that I'm buying. And I'm consuming. Um, is, is this pork clean? What, what, what is the story of the, the ingredients? Uh, you know, what are you doing to ensure that this is sustainably sourced, ethically sourced, and that, that there's clean, high quality ingredients going into it? Um, and, and at the same time, food and beverage companies, why they, they, you know, consumers are asking for this, they also have a challenge of having meaningful consumer engagement because the nature of supply chains is with brands, they're, they're producing the product. Um, and, and they're spending money on marketing and branding, but they have to rely on a very convoluted supply chain, sometimes multiple layers, six to eight steps deep between them and the actual customer, wholesalers, distributors, ultimately retailers to get that product. So they lose touch with how products are moving through the supply chain, as well as that direct connection with consumers, which makes it difficult to provide information on the brand narrative. Uh, and, and and what that also means, it's it's hard to differentiate from your competition. We've seen a lot of companies who have invested um, quite a bit of money on the quality and quality ingredients, on having sustainable and ethical supply chains, but are not really getting, let's say, credit for it in the market. Wait, where is the ROI? It's it, of course it's the good and ethical thing to do, but at the end of the day, we also need ROI on the investment. So how how do we challenge that? So the the solution we came up with and and, and were part of was putting individual. Um, QR codes, unique QR codes in each and every sachet that was linked to a blockchain traceability solution. And that was also tied in with existing loyalty programs and communication campaigns that were already going and are also happening in other channels. So how this specific pro product worked, it was not each and every ingredient that went into the product, which was traced, but we looked at specifically the hero ingredients that were involved, the primary one being the pork. Um, and Unilever had done an amazing job of already setting up and digitizing largely the process of tracking products all the way down to the farm. I mean, it's amazing the details they have. They could tell you in a batch, like the whole history of what a pig ate uh, and what, 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 what was its life and how it was treated on every single day of its life. Life, um, um, throughout. And then that was tracked from the pork farms all the way to uh, the various processors, the final production, then ultimately the consumer and the supply chain between the production and the consumers. And so what, what was happening setting up on in, using a hyperledger sawtooth um, instance is that various these various actors in the supply chain um, were entering and, and logging in um, uh, information as it was occurring uh, into into the blockchain and ultimately um, tying all of that together into you know from initially from lot numbers and meat processors to the actual batch numbers that were going out at production into the zoom a unique footprint and digital um, story related to that particular product. Um, and then as it moved its way to the consumer here, and we'll see um, if this video works, it seems like it is, we'll, we'll use the WeChats, very, very popular app to scan it. So consumers in the marketplace were able to scan the product um, and right away we're jumping into uh, an engaging 
um, mobile environment, which allowed them really to take a choice on the journey of what they want to do. First and foremost, they checked to make sure they had an authentic product. There was a page um, about the traceability of, of that, that, that product they were, they were buying that was being pulled directly from the blockchain um, that, that had been set up. They could click in, see the whole journey, the times, the locations, um, of the, the various steps in the supply chain and, um, before it got to them and even see the location of, of, of the scan of what they were happening. It was tied into certificates along the way, various third-party audits uh, that were occurring at different times um, and, and different steps along the supply chain was all tied together in this and also accessible um, um, to consumers uh, a, a, as well. Um, and, and beyond the traceability side, because it's important, uh, and you can see various other tabs right here, it's, mo it's moving along a little slow right now. Uh, hopefully everybody's Vietnamese is pretty good so they can read exactly <laughs> what, what, what's going on. But uh, there, there's a promotions tab. There was a uh, recipes tab for those who, who wanted to know how they could, um, here, here's the certificate that they're seeing right now, the Viet Gap certificate. Um, so they could get more um, out of the product. Now, uh, here's uh, just a view, I'm just skipping ahead. This was a backup for in case the video didn't work, but you can see more clearly the various different tabs and optionalities that consumers had to interact with it. And this, like I said, this has now been out in the market for over a year right now. Uh, the results of it have been uh, quite, quite interesting. First and foremost, it gave the brand a tremendous uplift um, that was, and this is important, driven by verifiable claims. Um, uh, on the blockchain. Um, they've seen a surge in consumer satisfaction, uh, mentions on social media, um, and, and also sales, uh, more importantly, um, largely because consumers and some of the reactions were, wow, I didn't know everything that went into the product, or wow, this gives me much more trust in, in what the, the product that I'm buying. And so this provided differentiation to um, their, their competitors. Uh, they had invested a tremendous amount of money, much more before compared to other uh, players in this specific market in the area, um, but they weren't getting the uplift they, they um, thought they should from this. But as they became more transparent and showed this, it really um, hit at home with consumers. Uh, beyond just the brand uplift, each and every scan being a data point drove a tremendous amount of insight, both within their consumer behavior and what was interest in the brand, but also in visibility in the downstream supply chain. And was able to identify some illicit activity that was occurring between the point of production and, and the consumer. Uh, and then beyond that, just you know, not really blockchain related, but this thing is, is it, it created significant savings on media spent. Um, because of this direct interaction, this first party data collection that was happening, um, you know, the, the value they were getting back and the cost of that data, if they were to purchase that or spend it through various traditional media spends, they literally saw hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings on that. Um, so, so all in all, what we do see is that companies who are, and, and this is being repeated with small and, and big brands alike, that if you go about and you really think about putting together a, a, a proper end-to-end -end digitalized supply chain that is then backed up by variable claims that uh, are with a, a proper blockchain system. And you bring that to consumers, it does resonate with them. Um, and, and the wallet at the end of the day um, is, is the, and the spend from the wallet specifically is, is a big indicator in the success of the project. So Anthony, I think with that, I'll send it back with you and we can hopefully get into some fun uh, Q&A and discussion. All right. Thanks, Emil Nathan. Really, really interesting. And some always great case studies and some great overviews from yourself. Whoever does your graphics work is, uh, deserves a pay rise. Um, a couple of quick questions before we go into the wider conversation. Um, obviously, a big part of the transformations required are at the production level, right, in terms of being able to embed the, the QR codes into um, whatever packaging format you're looking at. Could you give us a view on you know, what that experience is like or what are some of the key considerations with the clients you're working with in terms of the, the process transformation in production? Yeah, so, yeah, and I think, you know, there's, there's two ways to go. I mean, you can just do a, what we call unserialized unique identifier, which is the same across all SKUs. That's fairly basic and easy to do. And then you have serialized, uh, which each, let's say I talked in that example is each and every product um, or, or, or batch and lot will have a unique identity. And this is more difficult um, to, to do than the first. Um, but what we've seen in the last five years or so is there's been a huge transformation in the capabilities of digital printing that has really enabled this at scale. So a lot of the projects that we're doing right now, um, actually, um, we see that the existing packaging and printing um, companies that are suppliers and 
partners with these brand companies or we partner with as well, are able to integrate these unique QR codes at uh, or unique identities at scale. Um, and, and this is only increasing it because essentially this is becoming table stakes for label and printing suppliers. And so this is actually facilitating where it used to be a barrier. Um, this is now something that is made possible um, and, and really ushering a lot of more opportunities because at the end of the day, the granularity of the data and the granularity that, but that you both collective intelligence and are able to give to consumers or users of the supply chain from unique codes is very significant. Very good. So getting easier every day. Yeah, that's right. All right then. Okay, team, let's get cameras back on. We're into the Q&A segment. Let's do this. Everybody back. Ricardo, you too, just for funsies, just in case we get a question for you. Uh, I'm sure you can answer on behalf of Birdchain or Scantrust or anybody else who, who may have a question. Those of you listening in, uh, please do make sure you get your questions in the Q&A box down the bottom. Go in there, write any questions you like, blockchain related, digital twin related. Uh, there's definitely a strong digital twin flavor to this panel today. Um, you know, anything, anything blockchain specific, digital twin specific, IoT, enterprise. If you want to know what ca Halloween candy Rodolfo has got in the bucket behind him, uh, you know, ask away, guys. Whatever, whatever you want to know, uh, we're here for at least the next half an hour to, uh, to do your bidding. So uh, I'm going to dip into one of the first ones from the Q&A. Let's see... Uh, which one should we go with first? Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask. I think this one's related. And Nathan, you already warmed up, so I'm gonna take this one to you first, and we'll see whether the other guys have want to weigh in on it also. Um, the question's more broadly about uh, use of supply chain blockchain in pharma and medical products. I know that from a Scantrust perspective, you're not just looking at uh, pork soup all of the time. Um, could you give us a flavour of of where or some of the conversations you're having in and around other sectors around traceability? Sure. Yeah, well, well, pharma specifically is a very interesting uh, industry because even before, you know, blockchain was a, a word that uh, ranked very high in the Google search is that there was government regulations for serializations, uh, for serialization that have been going back 10 years and just recently have really been implemented in places such as the EU and, and the US. So regulators got in because of the nature of pharmaceutical products, um, how they, uh, counterfeit or illicit products can really uh, affect one's health. Um, each and every pharmaceutical product, most around the world today, has a unique identity in the form of a, a 2D barcode right now. Um, and, and so you have that serialization at pharma in scale, at scale already. Um, and because of that, in the pharma industry, the conversation around blockchain is a little bit different than others, but we are seeing some really interesting applications where products that go out and then are not sold and come back for inventory, such as you know, whether it's a product recall or uh, a distributor bought too much and they want to sell it back and then reuse it again. If, you, if we see blockchain being used as a way to verify, okay, hey, we can trust the path that this product took. And so typically in the past, you would have to kind of destroy or get rid of that medicine. And it could be perfectly good medicine. And there could be, a, um, you know, obviously there's a dollar loss for the brands and the distributors, but there's also um, uh, for especially products in high demand, um, they, uh, this was being wasted. Um, and, and so we see in the pharma industry specifically, blockchain is really having some interesting applications that the government says, okay, I trust that this product is still good for consumers. Now in, in, in other industries uh, than pork soup as well, I mean, in, in general, what, what we see um, you know, there's really two main areas and, and any product where um, you have some sort of claim that you're making that is important to your consumer and, and you want them to trust you more or you, whether it's your consumer or your partners, uh, blockchain is certainly being looked at as a tool um, to, to help with that. Beyond that, and I think this is probably the more powerful and you alluded to it, use uh, of it, but it, it's, it takes more effort, less technologically and rest more about just people and entities and vested interests is the collaboration. And I think that's ultimately where, you know, we see, we're going to see some of the more profound impacts of blockchain usage is being able to bring so many different parties together to collaborate based on rules of trust uh, and share more information they put a potent or, or, or you know, than they would have in the past. And I think we're still at the infancy of that because ultimately at the end of the day, you got to get a lot of people around the table to make that happen. It's not just a technology challenge. 
spot on. And I think you know, there's the there's the regulatory pressure with things like DSCSA uh, and drug traceability regulation yeah. in, in the US and kind of the equivalents in Europe, which I think are driving behavior uh, or driving initiatives very, very quickly. Um, IBM ourselves, we've been working with a number of different life sciences companies with the FDA in the US with Walmart, um, particularly on DSA related trace, DSCSA related traceability uh, and using blockchain as the technology to underpin that because you've got the multiple parties, you've got the traceability, you've got the recall, different actions that different actors can take in the supply chain. Uh, and then you've got sort of more traditional commercial behavior around um, particularly pharma, life sciences, uh, vaccines, uh, particularly topical right now. Um, but from a, a pure logistics and supply chain perspective, things like dwell time uh, and the time at which different vaccines uh, are left in different conditions will affect the useful life of that product. And so you end up with a significant amount of product wastage if you don't have visibility on the particular supply chain. Um, so <laughs> lots of value. We've been, Douglas, in in conversation, in we've been involved in a conversation recently also about the, the use potentially of a, a blockchain solution for authenticity, whether it is, for example, um, a, an antibody test kit which can be bought off Amazon. How do you know it's real um, and as the consumer? And so, and this touches on a question in the Q&A about, um, you know, it, can a consumer only use a particular proprietary app um, provided by Circular or ScanTrust or, you know, any one of us um, in order to, to establish that something is what it is claimed to be. And, and of course, the point is that when you look at the wider consumer base of things like antibody tests, it's, it needs to be as simple as looking up a QR code, um, just using a, a, a camera on a phone. Very good. I like that one. I nearly did the 2020 thing of talking on mute, which is definitely a faux pas when you're on a webinar. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, mean, I think the the important thing to note is that the, the the front end experience, the scanning component is only one one component of the entire stack of traceability that has to have integrity all the way throughout. Right. Nathan said it garbage in garbage forever. Um, you alluded, Douglas, to the, the challenge of being able to create a digital twin for something that can change form, shape, location, temperature, geography. Um, all of the different integrity points across all of that particular, uh, all of the different components of the stack and then across the horizontal of the supply chain all need to be considered. I think the challenge is, you know, the commercial case against that. You know, if you're going to be investing multi-millions in technology, if you're going to be delivering process change, um, Rodolfo mentioned at the, the beginning of his presentation that a lot of the, the processes were paper-based and maybe not standardized to start with. Once you start creating the kind of horizontal and vertical challenges of integrity, you start realizing why these things take six, 12, 24 months to come to fruition, because actually it's a lot of work, right? Sure. It also depends on, on who it is you're trying to equip. So if in my case, if I'm working with a car manufacturer as a car manufacturer that wants to satisfy themselves that they are they have fulfilled all reasonable obligations, for example, to source responsibly, eventually they may provide a certificate with a lookup to a consumer who buys a car to look up a whole pile of stuff if they're interested. But it's that's a different use case from the one where you know a consumer might want to scan a, a handbag or a pork soup and, and satisfy themselves at the point of purchase that this thing is genuine. Right. I want to yeah, I want to add a little bit of on on that point just because it does have to do with the the, the let's say the user journey. So I was going to say consumer journey because I think that was where more the question was placed in the Q and A. But I think what what Doug said it also has to do with non non consumers. So uh, authorities, as you said, your compliance department, your auditors, and whatever. The, you also need to understand when your data will be used, because as you said, it's not only that you put garbage in, but once you if you don't put garbage in and you don't uh, expose it in a such a way that it's going to be consumed, then it's just a wonderful repository of data that nobody's going to check. So, <laughs> uh, so, so going back to the question, right? So uh, it's not that you have to make the consumers trust your app and then go check on it. It's more about understanding and what part of the journey are they looking at, right? Uh, as Doug was mentioning, if I want to check my handbag or, or my stereo or whatever, um, is it, is it when I have already purchased it? And then I'm, of course, maybe more likely to go into the brand app, or is it more likely I'm at the shop shelf, and especially for, for our products, and thinking, hmm, should I buy shampoo on the left or on the shampoo on the right, right? So I'm trying to uh, bring some awareness to that perspective, and then the information in my present is also, and the interface might be also different. Yeah, and I, I think this, this that uh, that point Rodolfo makes dovetails into one of the other open questions that I'll just open live here. I was going to type the answer to, but easier to answer now is like, 
it was somebody was alluding to why would somebody trust a, a consumer app? I mean, a, an app controlled by a brand owner. Why wouldn't they trust one that's from an NGO or a third party? And, and that's a great point because it gets to the, the heart of trust. Now, the view I see is that it's actually less about what is the entry point to the content. The entry point being a brand, you know, an app from the, the, the brand or an app from a third party. It's more about the content that's being shared, right? Ultimately, I see brand owners are going to want to control the visualizations of their brand, right? So it's, it, it, brands want to be able to have some sort of ownership and control over what the consumer scans and what they see. But the content that's embedded within there, this is a different story. And as you go on, I see that you know, you're going to see trusted either industry consortiums run on blockchain, uh, trusted third parties, whether it be an NGO or otherwise. We already see that with like labeling on packaging where you see Rainforest Alliance or um, example, where this content will be within a branded environment. However, it's going to be coming from a trusted third party, right? And they're you know, ideally you know, backed by some sort of industry consortium or rules of what we know of how, you know, so this, this, uh, this data that's being shared, um, there's some standards to it. And I see that's the direction where it's going. So you, you, yes, brands are going to still can control the entry point in their app, but you know, they're going to be under pressure to give more credible information, which means inevitably they're going to have to work with NGOs and third parties to provide that content and not just be like, hey, this is directly from us. It's really interesting. I think there's, there's a, a risk that we say something along the lines of, well, it's got blockchain underneath it, so you can trust it even more, and it's branded. And, and you see um, organizations using the technology to just amplify what is a marketing message, as opposed to using some of the more powerful features that you can gain from a blockchain around traceability, transparency, business effectiveness, the ability to share information with multiple parties. I, I actually want to double click, as a great question, if I can find it. Uh, Vusa, who jumped in with a question here, um, particularly like the soup example, shout to Nathan for the soup example, outside of traceability for peace of mind uh, around ethical production for customers um, that are that way inclined, how else would blockchain benefit the business in respect to trust agnostic customers? Maybe Rodolfo, if you want to come in on this one, is sort of what are some of the other drivers beyond um, the peace of mind or the ethical production uh, that, that we're talking about here? Can I jump sure. in off this? Yeah. Sure, no worries, Doug. So I think it has to do a little bit more with efficiency in that perspective. So if you're not looking, as you said, maybe to uh, uh, to do responsible sourcing or to actually then use that responsible sourcing, as you were saying, for the marketing claims, it has to do with more how can you use this uh, track and trace or this traceability aspect of, of supply chain to, to drive efficiency, right? Uh, so, I mean, everybody knows uh, one of your uh, main use cases there at IBM with Trailens, right? That it's more about how, how can I trace when my products are leaving my warehouse, when are they being handed off to the 3PL and then to the shipper? How much of a certainty can I then have to fulfill the service level agreements that I have with my customers, right? Uh, so this is also from, especially in, in companies like us who have uh, retailers who have a very strict let's say, uh, supplier uh, agreements and service levels where you're actually also penalized. Uh, the track and trace functionality and being able to say, hey, no, this immutable record shows that we're the product was there at your warehouse at a certain amount of time. Uh, proof of delivery, for example, that's also comes in, into play in that sense. It's another way you can use this uh, these features. Um, I, I thank, thank you. Totally agree with all that. I just want to jump in on, on regulators. Um, we know, for example, that plastic taxes are coming in Europe. Um, so manufacturers of, of, of plastic products like Coke bottles will have to demonstrate that they're a minimum of 30% recycled. So you know, proving that um, you, know, you have a certain level of recycled content and potentially even that you responsibly source that waste plastic because you don't want to create a whole new world of exploitation and plastic picking in Indonesia um, is something that, that regulators will look at from a tax perspective. In Europe, we're also looking at carbon border adjustment taxes as part of the Green Deal. Again, how do you prove what you're doing and what the embedded carbon in something is? So there are a number of use cases which are driven by regulation trying to drive more sustainable behavior, particularly in Europe, but there are other jurisdictions as well, where the sort of distributed trust we're talking about here um, will play an important part in satisfying, for example, tax authorities. Very good one. Again, reg spend is a great way of being able to get funds allocated against transformation, but the, the more pressure is going to come, the more there's going to be a need. Uh, and in reality, the, the great thing about 
if you can start building that vertical and horizontal of traceability and capability, you can actually use the same data assets for a number of different things. It could be regulatory reporting. It could be single view of supply chain. It could be carbon footprint. Uh, it could be to, like Rodolfo said, validate that certain activities have happened to manage settlement and reconciliation in the procurement process. Traceability has knock-on benefits on a number of different levels of business process. So once you're there, once you're in that data utopia, um, for want of a better phrase, then there's actually a whole bunch of use cases that spin off from it. Uh, data Utopia t-shirt coming soon. Yes. Most of us uh, thought Utopia was a pub or something like that. But <laughs> it's really, <laughs> guys, just where is that? <laughs> exactly. In, in COVID-19, actually, it's data. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry about that one, Doug. <laughs> Utopia pubs closed down, unfortunately. It's online. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going I'm to read out the next question, which comes from Heather. Shout out to Heather for this one, because she's actually taken uh, the time to write an entire scenario. So I'm going to try not to butcher it as I read it out. Um, this one's specifically around detractors around digital twins. Um, the example given is that a transporter could claim that an item is placed in a refrigerated truck when, in fact, only a small part of the truck is refrigerated. The item isn't necessarily in the refrigerated portion of the truck, even though it was scanned in as being in a refrigerated truck. How do we uh, manage the kind of disconnect between the spoofing or um, fraud fraudulent traceability of certain activity once you get into the physical supply chains? Douglas, Who wants to have a go at that one first? I think Douglas lives through this every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm delighted that cobalt ore doesn't need refrigeration, having read that <laughs> question. But um, I mean, obviously, there are cold chain IoT devices that can you know, be attached to individual parcels of, of something in order to establish the temperature at which it's actually kept on its journey. Um, and that's clearly one of the potential solutions to this. There are as many creative ways to spoof or fraudulently or misclaim um, as, as there are people who can think of them. And our challenge as technology providers, all of us, is to learn from those rapidly and evolve our solutions to make it harder for people who, who want to mislead to do so successfully. I think it's a really good point. I think also at the same time is how much pressure are you putting on the certainty of certain activity and how do you proactively manage that? Is it, is it digitally? Is it physically through process audits? You know, if, if, you, if you can accept 90% validity of traceability, um, that's okay in some situations where it needs to be 100% because there's a significant contract or regulatory requirement against it, right? You know, 1% of nuclear material instead of 0.01% of nuclear material in my lasagna is still nuclear material in my lasagna and I don't want it there. So, you know, you've got to probably also apply the appropriate levels of controls and yeah. control audits against the processes you're looking at. We're, we're, we're working on projects around uh, nuclear security at the moment, um, where clearly the, the threshold of trust is extremely high. But then because the stakes are so high, the amount of money available to solve these problems is also very high. Um, and so, you know, whereas if you're looking at sort of low cost uh, or low value commodities, clearly the economics don't quite stack up. I'm assuming it's not related to lasagna. Otherwise, that would be the weirdest serendipity moment of my life. Thank, thankfully, no, but it did trigger the thought. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, Rodolfo, anything you guys want to bring in on this one before we uh, we finish Heather's question? No, I just uh, agree. It does have to do about prioritization. Uh, so Doug mentioned very well that you have kind of assets or, or physical things that you, because of the economics behind, you can't even afford uh, to place, uh, let's say, a, 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 any sort of coding behind, right? So especially in, in areas like in our categories where we have kind of very low margins in some cases and we have to go with volumes, it, it pretty much ruins any, any, any use case in that sense. So that's why, for example, in, in, in our case, the sustainability strategies are very well uh, formulated so that we know which are the raw materials which we look at and the rest as you said you have to kind of live with a little bit less amount of certainty mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly i mean the, the technology in theory exists in many cases it, it's a dollar sense and i think what we very often I, i've seen a lot of traceability or transparency projects or a blockchain projects be attacked because hey this is you know this is greenwashing or blockchain washing or whatever it may be and yeah there's could be an inkling of truth to this 
But I think what's important to realize is as you, what, what I see is these projects is as these projects are launched, even if it's not 100% verifiable every single second along the way, they're all, and these are still major undertakings, but they're driving ROI. And as you move the needle, you get to this point. And once it proves the ROI, it then allows for someone like Rodolfo to go back to his, his, his executive team and say, hey, I need more budget to drive this even further, right? So we're gonna, it's, it's moving in the right direction. Let's not lose track of that. Um, um, but yes, I mean, clearly they're, they're still holding. Uh, the supply chain is complicated. And, and at the end of the day, it's complicated and people want things for a certain price. Nice one. Thank you for that, Nathan. I've got a question here from Hafizola. I'm going to ask this broadly, and this is a quick fire round. Which industry is most ready for blockchain for supply chain? Battery materials, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Rodolfo? Uh, I, I honestly don't have a, an opinion here. I would say maybe something like pharma because of what Doug also mentioned, and you mentioned as well in regards to the the, the current moment we're living in and the fact that you do have a lot of, of fraud within that perspective, plus the fact that the big farmers should have the money. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. It's, let's, you know, when you're talking physical products, um, you know, pharma is probably the most ready and just because the foundation's for digitalization are already largely there from the regulations that are in place. That's a really good point. I, my, my response would be regulated industries where there is already a degree of digitization, standardization, such that um, you've already got a base from which to work. Um, financial services is a great example in and around blockchain because its business is digital prim primarily, uh, not in, in isolation, but there is a supply chain in financial services as well. There is traceability of asset movements, there is traceability of funds, uh, there is traceability of bonds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna argue that there is, there is a supply chain in FSI that is also worth considering. Um, Ricardo, you've been very quiet. You've been patiently, expertly making sure that everything's working behind the scenes. Uh, your thoughts on those industries that are most interesting or most ripe for blockchain and supply chain? Come on in on this one. I think I would also say that while, while the implementation is not the easiest, but the food and beverage industry is for sure uh, one that has a, a strong business case and interest uh, to apply um, blockchain for supply chain, simply because there is a, a strong business case from the end consumer's point of view of verifying the provenance of, uh, of the products and to learn more about the history and uh, learn more about the claims that the brands are making and, and so on and so forth. And, and it's also an area where we've seen a lot of investment uh, moving into in, in, um, in the last years. And um, that has driven to the food and beverage industry structurally starting to invest into the um, foundation that is needed to implement such a, a blockchain-based solution. Very good. A, a very well-prepared answer. He had, he had a lot of time to, to support that one. So I like it, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Um, getting some really good questions in the chat as well. I'm kind of jumping between Q&A and the chat and the thread and trying to pay attention to the answers you guys are coming up with. This is, this is definitely messing with my ability to multitask. Um, lots of questions around the different types of IoT devices out there. This is an interesting one and, and one that um, obviously is, is sort of part of any um, farm, farm to fork supply chain. Um, please keep provide any views on how these sort of initiatives are going to give benefits to general rural farmers. Who wants to come in first on that one? Um, we're working on a cocoa project at the moment, cocoa farmed in Brazil, um, where the farmers who uh, participate in trace, uh, this particular traceability scheme for um, a very, very large chocolate manufacturer um, actually get a premium price for their material because it is traceable. Very good. And I'm going to ask the bonus question on that one. How is that funded at the moment? Is that consumer funded? Is that enterprise funded, supply chain funded? How does, how does that benefit come from? Um, it, it, comes from the, uh, it, it, it comes from the chocolate manufacturer and the premium, they pay a small premium for the material, but also what they're looking to do, of course, is, you know, it, that there's, there's efficiency benefits from having a digitized supply chain as well. And so the business case is, is partly around how the digitization of previously undigitized supply chains can drive greater efficiency, um, but also share some of that benefit with the farmers. 
I'm glad you said that that exact point is what I was sort of fishing for here is that our experience working with Pharma Connect or some of some of the similar initiatives to what you're describing is actually don't expect the farmers to pay, but they are critical to contributing to the value. So as you construct your business case or your commercial case for how are you going to create value? And then as a result, how are you going to share it? Um, because everybody needs to benefit, or sorry, everybody needs to work together to benefit, being able to say that actually part of our contribution for achieving these benefits is going to be a contribution back to those at the start of the supply chain or at the early stages, yeah. um, as opposed to expecting them to pay or expecting them to transform. And if there's a, a back it's back to the mineral supply chains, uh, you know, there there isn't a commercial benefit except th that you have a legitimate route to market, that there's a requirement to provide traceability, but the traceability solution is free. So, you know, there, there are ways, there are different ways of providing that benefit. It doesn't have to just mean you get a little bit more for your, for your product. Very good. Rodolfo, Nathan, you guys want to come in on this one? I just want to agree on that perspective because I think it's important to highlight that it's, uh, at least from, a, if you're thinking of how to put this benefit on the farmer, it does have to do with kind of the heart, the established relationship that they have. So it's just exactly what Douglas said. So either they get a premium on the, on the, on, on the materials they're selling, or you're somehow ensuring that they can have a, a steady source of, of, of purchases, right? So that you're ensuring that they can sell their products continuously. So it's not that I'm, I'm beating down on in these tips, the farmers initiatives or whatever, I, I, I find them also quite inspiring and I, I tend, I also try to participate when I can. However, uh, for, for them, it's well, a buck today or five is better than potentially receiving five to 10 bucks tomorrow. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's essentially, you know, this comes back to the point I mentioned earlier, and you, you've touched on throughout Anthony, and it's that it's, you know, the using blockchain as a tool to increase collaboration and transparency throughout the industry. And ultimately, I think increase collaboration amongst multiple stakeholders from the growers to uh, distributors to, to the consumers and creating more transparency, specifically on pricing transparency, is ultimately going to benefit the, the farmers at the end of the day um, and, and giving more access to the, the buyers and sellers of, of those products and kind of a marketplace um, will, will, will benefit the farmers as well. So yeah, the tip of farmers, it's nice. It, it does something. Um, but if we want to look at more sustainable, imp impactful um, solutions to help the, the, the farmers, it, 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 needs a, a, <laughs> it needs much more uh, uh, bigger efforts to, to be undertaken. Very good. I'm going to try and give us about five minutes more. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give a shout to the people whose questions we didn't get to answer today. So Rajinda, Nakul, Raymond, Jin, who answered a specific question about wine. I don't know why it must be late in the day and seeing Nathan's Budweiser, seeing gin and wine all in the same thread. My brain is starting to just get thirsty just from this anyway. Uh, anonymous attendee, whoever you are, wherever you are, interesting question about digital twins and tokens. Sorry, we didn't get to it. Uh, Anna and Aldemiro and Fahim just coming in. Um, just saying thanks for your wonderful views. Um, so that was great. Some 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 love from the comment section as well. Thank you for everybody who um, answered questions, who, who came into the chat. And thanks to you guys also for answering questions in the background as we were going along. Um, final question from all of you. Um, and it's, it's probably the same question, but I guess suspect different perspectives. What else do you think is required at this stage for the use or adoption of blockchain technology to scale in the spaces that you're working on, the spaces that you're looking? So what are the conditions or what are the factors that we think is going to get us even further up that exponential curve of usage and impact? Who wants to go first? So Douglas, I, I, think, volunteer as ever. <laughs> I, I think that um, the ability for these platforms, which have evolved largely independently to work together, we talk about interoperability. I'm not talking about true cross-chain transactions. I'm talking about the ability for platforms to work together. Supply chains and networks, it is inconceivable that whole industries will um, you know, adopt one single monopolistic solution to support them. Well, some might, but most probably won't. Um, and therefore, these systems have to talk to each other. You know, I can phone you on your mobile phone without caring which network you're on, um, and, and likewise in return. And, and ultimately, we need to move to a situation where platforms like ours are able to work seamlessly together. Brilliant. Love that, yeah. Douglas. Thank you. Nathan? Yeah, the heart of it is is you know digitalization, right? There's a lot more digital, and this, and this will enable 
this enables the collaboration. But at all stages of the supply chain across all industries, uh, there needs to be more digitalization that's happening first. And you know, until that occurs at scale in an industry or within a company, you're not going to get the full benefits of, of, of a blockchain. Rodolfo. So I'm going to go with two soft factors as well, uh, uh, patience and, and, and collaboration. So I think uh, you alluded it to this topic earlier that it, these kind of projects take quite a bit to get going because you have to bring on board so many of the partners, be it uh, uh, your upstream su suppliers, be it your downstream customers, be it the consumers of whomever. It takes a while to get these things going. Uh, I always tell my management, it's not generally about how long will I take to develop the solution, it's how much will I get uh, time to spend to onboard all the, all the partners in there and to make sure that the governance is agreed so that you can then scale the topic up, uh, which brings me to the topic of collaboration, right? I think, as you said, when it's uh, one, uh, when it's, uh, let's say, founder-led, it's very easy. You just talk to yourself. Uh, but then once you start... Uh, expanding on your in your ecosystem you have to make sure that everybody agrees uh, that they make sure that the rules of the game are 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 let's set and agree to and that can either be very easy when you have very collaborative partners uh, but sometimes you don't have the most collaborative partners at the table and you have to make sure that you somehow manage to bring them bring them in and have their buy in as well mm -hmm. Love that, Rodolfo. Thank you very much indeed. Ricardo, you're not going to get away without having a final question yourself. Um, over the course of the last sort of hour and 15 minutes or so, you've had some really interesting observations. What would be the one or two things that were most profound or the things that you found most interesting over the course of this, this particular panel? Come, come back with uh, a key highlight if you'd be so kind. Of course. So thanks for the opportunity, Anthony. So I think what, what I have found uh, very interesting is that we've had three speakers that cover completely different uh, perspectives. So we had Douglas that covered like the whole upstream part uh, of explaining how, how complex it is to essentially track raw materials and uh, make sure that the finished good that you get, uh, you're able to, to trace back where, where these raw materials come from, which is sort of the upstream part of, of the supply chain. Um, we had uh, Rodolfo who, who brought in the corporate perspective on, uh, on uh, not only explaining about the use cases, but also outlining from, from a large corporate's perspective, how do we actually manage internally to convince our stakeholders to start a blockchain project and to really in, invest into, into this technology in the first place. And then we had Nathan who, who covered the perspective from the production of the good all the way until it reaches the consumer and the whole perspective of what the consumer is able to do thanks to, to, to blockchain. So what I really liked and, and was um, one of the highlights for me is that we're able to combine all these three views together uh, to essentially get like a, a very complete and, and holistic picture on, uh, on, on, uh, on what's going on um, in, uh, in the supply chain world, coupled, of course, with uh, your great moderation and, uh, and, uh, and guiding us uh, through here. So thanks a lot um, for, for that. All right. Thank you, Ricardo. I appreciate it. We've got probably a minute left, so we're going to do bonus round quickfire question um, to each of you. When uh, COVID has gone away and quarantines have been removed, where's the first place you're going to? Uh, starting with Nathan, because you're in front of a bunch of mountains anyway. Where's the first place you're going to go next? Uh, go see my parents in Vermont. Very good. Rodolfo? Uh, very much like Nathan, I would like to go see my parents in Mexico. See, I even have a tequila bottle up there just to put in oh. also my contribution to the wines and spirits <laughs> discussion. Very good. Douglas? Um, I'm actually planning a trip to the Congo, not joking. <laughs> so, yes. Very good. Uh, Ricardo? I'll probably, uh, I'll probably escape the, the dark, cold Berlin winter to somewhere in, uh, in Bali or Southeast Asia. <laughs> Very good. Very good. And thank you very much, Nathan, Rodolfo, Douglas, Ricardo, for joining us as an impromptu guest midway through this. Thanks, everybody, for your contributions. Uh, I'm sure you'll be happy for people to reach out to you guys on LinkedIn. Uh, I know you're all there. So please, guys, go do do please go check them out. Uh, any questions, anything we didn't cover today, please feel free to reach out to the speakers. Uh, shameless plug. If you want to hear more about the stuff that I've been doing, go check out the Blockchain Won't Save the World podcast. That's on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts and all of the above. Please do go check out Bird Chain. There's a bunch of other events, a bunch of other content that they've been producing, some really exciting panels from a bunch of other speakers over the course of the last couple of days as well. So please do go check that out. And that's it from us. Thanks very much, guys. See you again soon. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, yeah. everybody. One last announcement. We have another event tomorrow on blockchain for public administration. Uh, you can still register for that one on our website, perchain.com. You'll find the Eventbrite uh, sign up there. So hope to see a few of you there. And uh, the recording of the event will be available on uh, our YouTube uh, channel immediately after the event. So thanks a lot, everybody, for joining and uh, hope to see some of you in other events.